We are now rolling. <laughs> okay, I'm not self-conscious or anything. So, our presentation today is... <laughs> Examining activism. You're going to have to be louder than that. Examining activism. Thank you. Examining activism, uh, punishment of the digital age. So basically, I'm Bill Gardner. I'm, I'm a hacker. Good time, not the bad time. And I teach in the digital forensics and information assurance degree program uh, and Marshall, and then I have two co-speakers. And I'm Amy Tartabora, I'm a professor at Marshall University, I'm also the program director and marketing director uh, for our technology and digital focus group. And I'm Andrew Anderson, I'm a math PhD research assistant and gamer. No, and I'm also an author. Please buy, to buy this book because I need to buy a new car. No, 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 no. And uh, well, actually buy multiple copies. It's a great gift for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's also uh, just good for any any case. Let me try this clicker. Just give me a minute. Okay. So hackers, what's a hacker? Well, it's a good question. So. Uh, this is actually a study. This isn't me just talking off the top of my head. So we defined them. We operationalized the term hacker. So in this case, uh, we defined a hacker as a technologist with a skill set. Not all hackers are criminals. Uh, there are good hackers, bad hackers, white hats, gray hats, black hats, etc. Um, and then we uh, talked about the three different kinds of hackers. What's the thing we operationalized it for the course of the study? So we have crackers. Uh, which are hackers who illegally break into uh, systems. Script kiddies, people who download and use tools without knowing what they're doing. And then, of course, white hats and black hats and gray hats, which goes back to the old west, where the good guy wore the white hat, the bad guy wore the black hat. And then those people who engage in both uh, criminal and non criminal activity, we call gray hats. It's like a film strip. So the hacker ethic is, um, you know, access to computers. You have to have an access to computers to be a hacker. At least for the purpose of this talk, there's different ways of hacking. There's life hacking. Uh, hacker ethic says that all information wants to be free. There's a mistrust of authority. And specifically what we're talking about here is, is the hacking group anonymous. Um, Uh, this is also a trend community. Hackers should be judged by hacking, not their bogus credentials and degrees. You know, how many people in the community now are, are academics? Very few. Those people are self-taught. And there's a mistrust of people who have degrees and use the word cyber too much. Um, hackers believe you can create beauty and art on a computer and that you can change the world for better. And that's really the core of the hacker ethic when we talk about things like anonymous, who we also call hackers. So hacktivism, here's a definition of hacktivism, an academic definition. But basically, hacktivists are people who are using technology, um, things such as denial of service attacks and web defacement in order to further a, uh, a political agenda. In the case of anonymous, that's a social justice agenda, generally. For the lulls. Or for the lulls. And that's important, too. When you think about where anonymous came from, they were originally a trolling group on 4chan. And then Operation Technology happened, where they were trolling the Church of Scientology, and then they were like, hey, wait a minute, we can make a difference in the world. So then that's when it became way more political. So, Specifically for the study, we look at violations of the Computer and Fraud Abuse Act of 1984. Okay, I'm the next one, please. So, um, how many of you are familiar with the FBI? Okay. Um, I'm going to give a background of the particular group of federal institutions in the U.S. Currently, there are over seven, uh, 40 federal statutes um, in the U.S. to prosecute computer crime. Um, many of these um, were modeled after wire fraud statute, um, which was created in about 1952 or so. Um, however, the act that was created, the Wire Fraud Act of 
Constitution clearly predates um, and precedes the rise of the computer crime as we know it uh, exists today. So obviously, new legislation had to come about um, to address the issue of computer crime. In 1984, uh, what was created was the Computer Access Device and Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And interestingly, um, this was created a year after, after the release of the uh, film War Games. And I have a, a, a picture of that particular film starring the young Matthew Barber. Um, in which he plays an a, a hacker who um, accesses a U.S. Um, military secret. And so it seems like in the, in the buzz on um, the internet that there's this linkage to the creation of this Computer Fraud and Abuse Act um, that coincides with this particular Hollywood film from 1983. But that's for another presentation, another discussion. Um, nonetheless, the legislation that was passed in 1984 defines the term protected computer as any computer used by financial institution or federal government or a computer used in or that affects foreign or interstate commerce or communication. Now there's also some language on the internet um, that suggests that this language has been further amended and changed to include all or any networked computers or any computers connected um, to the internet. And I'm still working on fleshing out some of those language changes and amendments that have been made to the CFAA. Um, so I presented to you the, the long, the, the, the long um, name for the act, the Computer Access Device and Computer Fraud Act of 1984. It was shortened in 1986 to what we know it as today, the CFAA. So today, if you look again at the, uh, the federal code, you will see it represented as Section 1030 of Title 18 um, of the U.S. Code. And what we have seen is that most of the hacking crimes committed by hacktivists um, are charged with this particular 1030 statute. And the statute clearly defines a number of crimes, at least seven uh, crimes total and their penalties. Uh, for crimes such as um, hacking, cracking, virus dissemination, uh, computer espionage, among others. I think I've got it all covered, but I haven't. So. Okay, so what is it all? They're um, a type of hacktivist group, and as Bill said, they started on the website 4chan. Um, Specifically, B Born. How, how many are is going to admit they were on B Born? <laughs> cool. So, um, so and, and for chain, what it was is um, you could post as a username, uh, whatever, and then or you could stay as anonymous. And it started as a joke. Like everybody would just start posting as anonymous as one, and it was like one person kept posting the same thing, and it just kind of. That's just where the name came from. Um, and so, uh, so then what happened with uh, Scientology is that you had a lot of people getting political. And so um, they started out uh, attacking the Church of Scientology. And they, it, it's important to note, though, too, like not everybody in Anonymous is a hacker or knows a lot about um, computers. Some of them are just activists. Like, and um, and so and so when they were protesting and going out in places to uh, specifically church Scientology, they used the guy boss map because it was important to cover your face you know, so they, they didn't get prosecuted. Um, one of their little sayings is we are anonymous and information is free. Um, expect us and they kind of change that up in their videos a little bit. So just to bring you up to speed, what we wanted to do with our presentation was provide you with a background about hackers, their ethics, and then take you specifically into those who promote or take part in hacktivism. Uh, present you then with the current statute, uh, the CFAA, which obviously relates to our study. Um, and now you'll see then, as we kind of take on from a, a very general perspective to a more uh, specific one, we, we 
decided uh, last fall to create a study where we could examine the charges that have been, um, and the penalties that have been imposed on members of Anonymous who have taken part in hacktivist-like hacktivist activities. Because if you listen to the members of Anonymous, they're all getting thrown under the bus. They're all facing these extraordinary, you know, extraordinarily harsh prison sentences. So we wanted to test that. Right. So we're, so, exactly. So we're, you know, wanting to comb through the internet. Um, and we wanted to see if we could find those members who have been charged for partaking in certain activist-related operations. Um, so that involved obviously scouring the internet for indictments, or um, and sometimes it was tweets, sometimes it was you know news-related media that would spell out you know what the uh, member was charged for. So we wanted to also. <laughs> um, there's your next group. Okay. Um, we also then, after finding indictments, if we could, um, and if they were available, and that's a, another issue. Obviously, uh, federal indictments are supposed to be private documents um, and not public knowledge. However, we found interestingly that a lot of these indictments have been slept up on the web for all to see, which obviously follows the ethics you mentioned earlier all information should, should be free. So it wasn't that difficult to find a number of the um, indictments. Nonetheless, uh, we wanted to look at their sentence, uh, their charge, and then their sentence. We wanted to follow the case from the time that they were arrested, indicted, and then, of course, put to court and were sentenced. Not all of them, um, as you'll see later, um, have been sentenced, even though some of these operations uh, were you know, committed in ten, uh, 2010 and 2011. The other uh, item that we wanted to examine, uh, if we could, was what is the response from these anonymous members? Um, this happened and happened more specifically from anonymous. Uh, you know, what kind of language or um, commentary are they providing on the internet about this? Um, and that's probably the more underdeveloped portion of our study that we're still <coughs> fleshing out because, um, as you can imagine, you know, the internet is very large, very vast. Um, and so we're trying to find the full quotes and phrases and commentary from those individuals <coughs> and um, analyze them, if you will, in a qualitative fashion. So the, the sources that we examined clearly were primary sources, your indictments. Um, sometimes there's transcripts or testimony or interviews that we also examined, as well as secondary sources. And so we examined a lot of newspapers as well. Um, we went to, we pulled from a variety of um, sources, the, the newspapers particularly, I'm thinking of um, the New York Times, would have an article about uh, a certain member uh, in the UK. There's the Guardian, their newspaper, I think the Telegraph, also in the UK. We pulled some content from the documentary, The Our Legion, um, and particularly some of the quotes came from that particular documentary. Um, and other sources, of course, blogs, like I mentioned, tweets. I think uh, Bill pulled from uh, darkreading.com or, you know, some various sites um, like that to get information for us. And I also would would, uh, would talk about Gabrielle Alexander's new book, yes. uh, which is basically a, a history of Anonymous, which is very helpful in helping us try to um, fill in the narrative because she has access to the sources that we don't have access to at this point. <laughs> and it's called, what's the name of the book? Packer Whistleblower Spy. I'm probably screwing it up. But it's really good. It's like, we are, we are we, well, anyway. But it's a great book. Isn't that based on the fact that they're trust funds? Uh-huh. She's an anthropologist, so her her way of, of studying anonymous is from the inside. Right. So she has built a lot of, you know, it's sort of like studying uh, aboriginals. You sort of go live with them, and that's what she's done with anonymous. It's about 2,000 years. Right. Treating them as a subculture, yeah, if you will. Right. right. Like living among the tribe, as an anthropologist would. Whereas our study, um, you know, clearly, you know, Bill and I, represent Amanda, um, a marriage of, you know, someone who has inside, 
inside view of uh, hacker world and those of us who have a, a criminal justice background uh, where we are out there trained in certain methodologies and research to maintain um, objectivity, right? Uh, and that's where we found our study to be rather unique from the way in which Coleman has conducted hers. So we look specifically at specific operations. Specifically. <laughs> uh, we have to narrow our focus to operations which actually have outcomes. So were people indicted? And then were people sentenced or were they tried? And we looked at Chanology, uh, of course, which was the trolling of Scientology in 2008. We looked at Operation PayPal slash uh, Avenge Assange which was denial service attacks uh, against PayPal for not uh, processing uh, donations for the uh, WikiLeaks funds and also the Assange Defense Fund, uh, Operation Payback, which 2010 to 2011, which was against um, people who were trying to oppressively um, snuff basically oppressively where I'm looking for. I'm having a loss. I think it's text script. No. Uh, operation <laughs> payback. Um, um, he stood up. <laughs> so I'm, operation payback was against uh, basically copyright holders that were doing things that were overly jerky draconian to exercise their copyright. That's a bad explanation. Look it up, it's on Wikipedia. It's on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, HP Gary's were uh, members of an IMA specific law uh, sec. Social engineered their way into HP Gary and highly embarrassed them by publishing their private documents. Uh, Operation Sony. Does Sony get hacked like every three weeks? So, Op Sony specifically is 2010, which was a, a law sec operation. Stratfor, uh, which is a good operation because there's at least two major players in Anonymous and law sec that ended up in prison, including uh, Jeremy Hammond and uh, the Playboy of the, of the Anonymous group, uh, Eric. Eric Brown, yes. And then Operation Last Report, Resort, which was a reaction against the treatment of uh, Aaron Schwartz. Aaron Schwartz. Yes. Next time I'll actually know. That's all right. I'm out of it. So this is the message to Scientology. This uh, Anonymous develops videos. Um, they're as much a propaganda machine as they are a machine uh, of denial service attacks. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are Anonymous. Over the years, we have been watching you, your campaigns of misinformation, your suppression of dissent, your litigious nature. All of these things have gone awry with the leakage of your latest propaganda video into mainstream circulation. The extent of your malign influence over those who have come to trust you as leaders has been made clear to us. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed for the good of your followers, for the good of mankind, and for our own enjoyment. We shall proceed to expel you from the internet and systematically dismantle the Church of Scientology in its present form. We recognize you as serious opponents and do not expect our campaign to be completed in a short time frame. However, you will not prevail forever against the angry masses of the body politic, your choice of methods, your hypocrisy and the general lawlessness of your organization have sounded its death now. You have nowhere to hide, because we are everywhere. You will find no recourse and attack, because for each of us that falls, ten more will take this place. We are cognizant of the many who may decry our methods as parallel to those of the Church of Scientology. 
Those who espouse the obvious truth that your organization will use the actions of anonymous as an example of the persecution of which you have for so long warned your followers. This is acceptable to anonymous. In fact, it is encouraged. We are your SPs, and over time, as we begin to merge our pulse with that of your church, the suppression of your followers will become increasingly difficult to maintain. The believers will become aware that salvation need not come at the expense of their livelihood. They will become aware that the stress and the frustration that they feel is not due to us, but is sourced much closer to them. Yes, we are as pleased with the self-suppression we could never muster as eclipsed by that of your own RTC. Knowledge is free. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. So, uh, you've all probably seen these videos. Uh, they make some really good videos, actually. Uh, Anonymous has a propaganda machine. The propaganda machine release videos about what their next threat is. That's the so reason, reason they're so easy to track. Because if you're a collective that only comes together for specific operations, you can't really do it in secret. So, this is all part of the Anonymous machine. Soil, but, but they were in a foreign country when they committed the crime. Right. That foreign country had prosecuted them. Many of them have served time and have been released. Right. So when we were looking at their sentencing compared to our sentencing, there was the question: Are we comparing apples to apples here? Right. And we decided we need further study with this because they technically could still be charged under the United States law and extradited. But there's the diplomatic question of: We're going to say to you, okay. And your sentence wasn't harsh enough, so we're just going to go ahead, pluck your citizen out of your country, and then charge them in uh, in federal court, and put them in federal prison, and, you know, is that a diplomatic thing to do? And I think that's still an open question about what could happen. So it's no surprise, then, when we examine the federal indictments that the most common charge applied to these hacktivists um, clearly was, you know, the, uh, you know Section 1030 of Title, 13, of Title 18. Um, and what we found then more specifically, as I mentioned, there's seven uh, crimes that are out in this federal legislation. And the one that you see there, um, the most common charge, 
when we look at all 45 members um, in our database, uh, pertain to knowingly causing the transmission of a program information code or command, and, and as a result, int intentionally intentionally causing damage uh, without authorization to a quote protected computer. Um, the penalties, as you see from this federal code, um, are quite extraordinary, and a lot of members have commented online that these are very draconian penalties. Um, in some cases, depending on the uh, damage that is done and the harms, um, an individual could face, you know, 20 years and have a felony charge against them, um, a 10-year sentence. Um, again, it all depends, though, on the extent of the harm and the intent or mens rea if you're in you know, criminal justice. Um, in addition, the theme that we found um, is that a number of these individuals also had the charge of conspiracy. Okay, so you see that as the um, 18 U.S.C. 371. Um, so aiding and abetting conspiracy charges were also included on a number of these federal indictments. Um, and after um, you know researching that further, it appears that there's a, a recommendation or part of the legislation that that encourage prosecutors to include that conspiracy charge um, as well, um, I suppose to maybe further stack up the charges or, you know, get them with something additional so that they can face um, more, more penalties or lengthier sentences, if you will. In addition, um, when we looked at the sentencing, that's what this particular uh, slide reflects, there's a lot of cases that are still pending, and as Bill had mentioned, um, a number of folks have chatted on the internet that they're they're being uh, slapped with very very long sentences, and, and those who have been sentenced, um, we could argue, you know, out of the 45, not all of them have actually uh, received such hard penalties or sentences. Um, I kind of extrapolated and, and found about eight of them. Sir, well, actually, two or three served about a year. Um, uh, about three or four have served three months in a halfway house, you know, which is uh, obviously far lesser than some of the time in the federal penitentiary. Um, Eleven of the fourteen in Operation PayPal had their charges actually dropped. Um, so that was also a very interesting finding. And again, we're kind of waiting on the internet when those sentences well, are, are handed down, which is also not uh, to interrupt. Study, but, but I think it's interesting to us that we had a heck of a time finding the outcomes of these cases. Uh, when the PayPal 14, which was held up as the poster child of draconian prosecution by federal authorities for a denial of service attack, um, you know there was funds. There were websites, and all of a sudden they all disappeared. And we're like, what happened? And it was really hard to find the outcome of their cases, which was most of them wrong. Um, but, you know, probably the worst case is Jeremy Hammond, who's serving 10 years for H.P. Gary. That's all I have. <laughs> and I think this goes back, though, to the point again from a criminal justice standpoint that you know again if you if there's that intent is proven in the court of law and if the harm um, is extraordinary you're obviously going to serve and if you are specifically conspiring and targeting a federal computer um, or military computer then well, you are going to find in the case well also in the case, in the case of Hammond in the case of Hammond uh, there is some there are some questions about the case because there are allegations that he did actually did the hack at the direction of Cebu, who was at the time under, under the, it already flipped and was under the direction of the FBI. So uh, Mr. Hammond has pled the case that he was in track. Uh, the other harsh sentence was uh, Derek Brown, who doesn't know when to shut up. <laughs> uh, he continues to basically piss off the federal authorities and they continue to stack charges against him. But if you know anything about the penal system, uh, what, no 14 year old laughs back there? Um, <laughs> that most of these people have pled for lesser charges. 
so they haven't really been smacked with, you know, 50 years or 20 years. So, yeah, echoing the same thing that Bill just said, um, you know, many of them, once, once you have that federal indictment in front of you and an attorney, they're going to say, plead guilty, lesser charge, plead guilty. And so, again, in our database, what we found um, after combing the internet, only the individuals that <coughs> them pled guilty, lesser charge, obviously, can be accepted. Um, so that way, we can show that we had uh, you know, a misdemeanor, you know, pled down to a misdemeanor defense as opposed to a felony charge. Uh, but yeah, also, the other thing that Bill was mentioning in distinguishing the Hammond case, um, you know, Sabu kind of, you know, it has a special place in our research because that changed the game for others who were hacking or, or engaged hacking like activity uh, because of his actions. Um, obviously, there he he had I think his sentence is up here. Who uh, was? Well, actually, I thought that he had him sentenced. Well, I think they gave him, so like, uh, him maybe him um, that was suspended. Suspended. Yeah. Right. So, as I mentioned, uh, some of, some of the other cases uh, are kind of playing out in the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland. Um, there's a couple others that we found with um, Operation Last Resort, so which we've done research uh, recently. And uh, one of the individuals uh, was in the UK, and there were three, two, cons two co-conspirators in Australia and one co-conspirator in Sweden. Um, so again, what's happened in our research is, you know, obviously we knew that anonymous is global, um, but here then we're trying to process how those federal indictments in the U.S. play out when there are individuals. Um, right. Charged outside, and this is still a, an evolving situation. Even though we thought we'd be able to sit down and look at it and find outcomes, what we're finding is our our, our conclusion is we need more study because there's just not enough uh, data. Sorry. No, you're right. There's not just sure. not enough data at this point um, because people are in such limbo to have a good sample. To actually come to any conclusions that make any sense. Right, and, and again, adding to what Bill's saying here, from a research standpoint, I was hoping that I could have a database of 45 individuals who I could examine, analyze, and then say, okay, here are the sentences that were handed down, here are the pleas, etc., the charges. Um, some of these cases are still pending. A lot of the Operation Payback folks have not been sentenced, and there was a very large indictment. Um, that also outlines conspiracy for those individuals, and only one of those individuals who had the disability and lived in Ohio um, was charged right away, but the others still have not been, or at least we cannot find any information on them. So a portion of our research is incomplete, which oh, makes it difficult for those things to drop. Part of the inability to use PACER data. PACER is the, the system that holds federal court documents, and you would think that federal court documents are public record. They're not. They're behind the paywall, and as a result, because of our institutional limitations <laughs> on research, uh, we can't use that data, so that makes it a little harder. So unless somebody's taking that and publishing it, we don't see it. No, we're not allowed to use it. That's another that's another presentation that we have. Well, I mean, that's the whole thing with uh, that's what. Short was doing was trying to get JSTOR or Pacer data in the public domain. We want to talk about activities. So I went back to um, the third research question of our study, and um, again, this is an evolving process that we did pull some commentary from members of Anonymous again who engaged in a variety of operations that were the focus. Um, so you can see that from Operation Technology, uh, how many members were really charged uh, and served uh, 366 days in the federal uh, lockup, um, or again, DDoSing and you know, engaging in a number of other activities against the Church of Scientology. Uh, but again, pulling some of the quotes, and this is uh, these are quotes from the We Are Legion documentary, uh, you can tell that these individuals, um, 
I think are acting in the spirit of what they believe truly to be hacktivism. Um, that in empowering feeling that they're making a difference. Um, and they're doing it from behind the computer with, in a collective of others, um, you know, just like them. They need a cause. In addition, we have that making com comments that, you know, oh my goodness, I didn't realize what I was doing. Uh, kind of had that shock factor, and I think that was also echoed in the documentary, um, again, which is the closest thing that we have to almost an interview with right, some of these we individuals. Right, we don't have interviews at this point. At right. this point. Right, right. So, uh, we have, again, uh, people who don't know it's a big deal until they get that knock on the door from the federal government or the FBI agents, you know, who are raiding your home and taking your computer away from you. Um, in addition, the, the other quote from him um, obviously echoes the sentiment that we're finding um, on the internet from a, a number of activists uh, regarding how lopsided the punishment is, how stringent, how rigid the CFAA is, mm -hmm. um, and how, again, draconian, um, and how the penalties um, are so severe that if this is truly the internet protest, civil disobedience, if you will, um, then why are they faced with, you know, up to 10 years in prison um, in some cases? Whereas if you were protesting on the steps of a federal government building, you may be getting here, maybe, in a fine or a fine. Whereas here, the, the penalties seem so much steeper. Um, one of the female members who took part in Operation PayPal, Mercedes, um, is also quoted here in the end. You know, she's, so it pops up a lot in the, the documentary. She's very vocal. And very vocal. Yeah. Uh, and again, we can, you know, from a research standpoint, we're analyzing the qualitative, the text in a qualitative fashion here. Um, and what you see at the echo, uh, again, is that feeling of, I'm engaged in a protest. You know, I'm speaking out. This is a vehicle for us to speak out. Nobody owns the internet. Um, and so, therefore, we have the right to speak freely and to do what we see is right. Um, and they can feel that sense of um, excitement, right? And then the last quote, uh, here's a section from an anonymous member of anonymous in the documentary. Um, <laughs> so that individual um, speaking about H.B. Gary, right? And um, I don't have my glasses on, but you can see our face. It's mine. Um, so <laughs> you can, it says, um, oh, this is something more about angry, you know, quote, you have one charge, a high from which you try to steal money. You think the thief is not to get this. Well, here we are. You know, so again, you have a variety of mixture of commentary from different members, and simply what we're doing is again, analyzing these different phrases to kind of draw some conclusions about their sentiments on this activity. I, I would think the, the other thing that we should mention is we can't look at things like Operation Tunisia because no one was prosecuted for it. In that case, members of Anonymous were actually attack, attacking a foreign government. Well, on top of that, you've got attribution based on the fact that the hackers in. Well, I mean, the hackers, you, I you know, in that case, we know that they, they, a lot of them were in the United States. They were, very, they were very open and obvious about what they were doing. They were enabling a revolution. And it wasn't just Tunisia, and then it spread to Egypt. Uh, we had the Green Movement in Iran that was crushed. Uh, so, you know, we had these, Libya, and we had these, these, these uprisings that were supported by Anonymous. In that case, they were keeping lines of communication. When, they, when their government shut off the internet, Anonymous actually kept the internet up and running. And when they had needed uh, first aid instructions about first aid for tear gas and rubber bullet wounds. They were actually getting those from anonymous. We didn't study that because it was never criminalized. Uh, also, we have a situation with the guy who exposed the student girl rapist who still is in limbo. He was indicted but never sentenced. Also, of his case, the things he revealed. I must think he was getting charged with uh, or someone, I want to say, was it hacked a uh, billboard or a uh, scoreboard? But that was never actually proven to be him in any way, but someone on the line did it. There's a, a lot of allegations against him about some past behavior, some past problems he may or may not have had with his girlfriend that came 
after his indictment. So you wonder, where did this come from? Is this a smear campaign? But nothing's ever happened to him. So we left him out of the study because there is no measurable result. And my question to this, you know, we watched the anonymous documentary and went, oh my god, these bunch of hackers are out. And then you watch it two or three times, you know, like, wait a minute, this kind of makes sense. I mean, I don't, it doesn't make sense to break into people's computers. It doesn't make sense to launch denial of service attacks. But some of the things that Anonymous says about social justice, uh, you know, are kind of interesting. You know? So, maybe it's I'm under the sway of the propaganda. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> we didn't look at Occupy either. We kind of, we had that sort of Occupy, um, you know, a very interesting figure who's Commander X, who's a very interesting figure, but they don't properly fit into the categories, uh, academics, we have to categorize and operationalize things, and they didn't fit into our study, so they are excluded from the study uh, in order to make the data more manageable and sure, if that's the way to and I, I, I love it because you wrote it too. It's not an point where it's, um, you know, I thought it would be a clean, neat, tidy, you know, database again of, of names and indictments, et cetera. Um, and yet you find some members involved in multiple ops, mm -hmm. which also started to get, you know, difficult to you know, collect and also. I mean, make uh, sure like that I was saying before, right? there are multiple op Sony's. I mean, op Sony, is that the recent bleach uh, of Sony Entertainment? Or is it? The time that an us to go on Sony uh, for the PlayStation, or is it the time that Anonymous uh, uh, Walsec basically uh, had to do the basement on a, a weekly basis? I mean, Sony was the number one part of Walsec. Um, all this stuff overlaps. It's hard to take something as messy as an internet collective uh, with overlapping actors and overlapping operations and actually make it into something that you can study. Because that's what we've struggled with for a year. Anyone have any questions? Yes, you have the best uh, the back of the baseball cap. Uh, is there any link or correlation between the number of anonymous members being charged versus people who aren't members of anonymous that are doing the same thing. So uh, is anonymously being uh, is anonymous being unfairly targeted? Well, you know, if you're a member of anonymous you have to operate in public, which means that you have no operational security. Now if you're a hacking gang or a credit card gang oh, Adrian. Also as far as anonymous if you're a member there is no actual official membership. There's no yeah. leadership. Anybody who says they're anonymous is anonymous, and they don't all have the same political agenda other than possibly lulls. That might be the only unifying force, because you'll have people who are slightly right-wing, slightly left-wing. I'd say generally there's a leftist to, li to libertarian bent, uh, but then there's people who, and I'm going to use, uh, well, I actually won't use the in-culture terminology because I've been told it's wholly inappropriate. What's that? New facts and old facts? Oh, moral fags and so oh. forth. There's actually people in anonymous who, when you they, talk this about is the language they use. You have to use this terminology. Yeah. Uh, that who actually don't like the whole, you know, moral aspect at all. They just thought we should do the lulls and go out there and mess and with people. That's the older 4chan way of doing yeah. things. There are still people still trolling. Yeah. I troll Adrian. Constantly, yes. <laughs> and no, but Anonymous isn't a unified group. I guess... Lulsec, which yeah. spawn off of some of that stuff, that would be more unified because it's a small cluster of people. Yeah, you had a, a group of people who were actually actively engaging in breaking the law. Not all members of Anonymous are lawbreakers. And the reason they were wearing those masks is not so much prosecution as they were worried about Scientology coming after them because Scientology had come after people in the oh, past. Crazy. I, I want to address Ben's uh, okay, question sorry. a little differently. Um, from my research, my classified from a class you probably have already in our program. So um, I think what uh, uh, the further study could warrant is <coughs> looking at those who've been charged with the CFAA who are not affiliated with the and then comparing them to members of Anonymous who have been charged. Same charge, same type of crime, and then look at the outcomes or sentence outcomes. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so, what I was trying to get to. Was, yes. I, I, was, I was wondering if 
that would be somebody who claims anonymous is being unfairly targeted. Exactly. And that would give you the opportunity to say, okay, we're comparing now, right. you know, members who have the same demographic, the same age, um, one's a member of anonymous, and here's their charge, they were hacked, they hacked into whatever computers, and an individual not in anonymous did the same thing and make comparisons. And that would actually be obviously in a research you know uh, context. Uh, a better way to go about it and more talent and well, you can make those kinds of You pointed questions. out something that happened in research. You start with one one question and then you get further, you find other questions and you need further research. So my advice to you is to go ahead and apply for graduate school and get help us. And we need the money. Yeah, you're in that apartment. <laughs> <laughs> We're down in that apartment. Oh, oh, by the way, the house next to my new house is for rent. So. <laughs> well, go ahead and find your house. Yes, you in the back. Can John read that book by Oldman, the We Are Anonymous? No. I picked that up. I was in DC and I stumbled on it in a slide there. It was actually fairly, Very good. fairly thick book and it's fairly interesting. But we we only looked at the Coleman book because I'm using it in my first year seminar class. Oh, so I get to stand stand in front of freshmen and say things like, "New facts can't try things," because we have to teach them about the trolling culture. And then there's a whole chap there's a whole chapter in the Coleman book called Moral Faggotry, which is about moving from being uh, doing it for the laws to doing it for political ends. But we have not done a literature review at this point because the, the focus of the study was a content review of what we could find on the internet. So that, once again, is a further step that we should do as a literature review. Right, and I would also add, this is by Carmi Olson, the book you're yeah. speaking of. I, I read a few things online that discredited her or him. It was uh, well, you know, it the non opinion based stuff just kind of falling at some book stand and kind of getting in the Even I think uh, it was a nice I understand. for someone who didn't know anything about it. I understand it. where you're coming from, but it may help fill off the narrative. Oh no, I'm not the, I'm the definitely talk, saying we should, we should look, look at, at it. it. Yeah. But I just was going to add that one of the things I have found I, I come across that. There's as well. a lot of people will discredit Coleman because she was she's so involved. These people are her friends. Gabriella. In fact, uh, I'm trying to bring her to campus. Uh, but yeah. it takes well, it takes some time to get her here. She's a very good person. So maybe a next year we'll have Gabrielle Coleman and we can ask her these questions. Anyone else have a question? Dave's finishing finishing up his presentation now, so. Cody, oh, you're okay. <laughs> you must have done the presentation in the car. Yeah, he made me drive. <laughs> uh, that's, that's how he does. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. If you don't have any questions, uh, we have about a 10 minute break before next speaker, which is Dave Kennedy. Um, like I said, buy my book, do the money. And, uh, <laughs> we probably will do a presentation maybe next eight on what we find. But we may have something sooner than that. Thank you very much. Thank you.